In December of 1997, the cremation of a very special lady took place just here behind me at Accrington Cemetery. And it would also close the final chapter on what was, and still is, one of Accrington's most infamous of horrific tales. This, my friends, is the tragic story of Agnes Rhodes Wildman. Today's story takes us back to November 1918 when a young soldier by the name of Joseph Wildman was tragically killed while on munitions duty over in Scotland. Leaving behind him was his wife Maud and his young daughter Agnes Rhodes. The death of Joseph would hit Maud extremely hard as one could imagine. She was left alone in the world with her young daughter Agnes and Agnes was barely four and a half months old. So Agnes herself would never get to know her father. In 1921 and three years after the death of Joseph Maud would remarry and she would marry a man called John Worley, whom she had known ever since childhood. Now, from all accounts, he was quite a catch. He was a good looking, handsome young man. And all of Maud's friends and work colleagues all said Maud was one lucky woman. However, Worley himself had a fondness for drink. And he would often come home to his parents' house on Claret Street intoxicated. He was also an extremely violent man and especially towards Maud. Now when the couple married on the Easter Sunday in 1921 they moved in with Wally's parents on Claret Street. But straight away Maud you would argue and you could argue and say that she regretted her decision to marry Wally instantly because from all accounts and from what we've read he soon turned his fondness for drink and he would use that as an excuse for the beatings and the physical, the verbal abuse that he gave towards Maud. Drink is no excuse. We know that. And his violent tendencies were going on before they moved in to Claret Street and with Wally's parents. The physical and the verbal abuse was ongoing from the moment they were courting, they were a couple. They would often be seen on the streets in and around Accrington and to where they lived. They would be seen arguing with Maud herself raising her fist towards John Wally. And we'll get more into the old fist shaking and, and the issues Wally had with Maud shortly. Now as for John Wally and his violent outbursts, like I was saying, he would often be seen on the cobbled streets of Claret Street, of Victoria Street, and that on Clement Street, all very close to where the events of September the 17th and 18th would occur. He would be seen arguing with Maud on a regular basis, and it was always when he was drunk. He would blame drink as being the excuse but as I was saying, we can't use drink in any shape, way or form for beating a woman up. But this is what he would do. And it was during the mornings and during the days when he was at work and he was sober, he would be apologetic. And this is where I think a lot of colleagues and a lot of the female of the species, we could say that it's, it's this persona that he gave to people, that he was a pleasant, polite, well-mannered young man. But it couldn't be further away from the truth. Like I said, as soon as drink got into him, he was violent. So we don't know why 
obviously they moved from 15 Claret Street to number 12 Victoria Street but it was in September 1922 when they would make that move so you had Wally, his wife Maud and his stepdaughter Agnes but it was at number 12 Victoria Street where this story will now take a darker turn and things would only get worse for Maud and her young daughter Agnes on Monday the 17th of September things will come to a head and after finishing her shift at the nearby cotton mill Maud returned home to find John sat at the kitchen table he had just finished eating food that Maud had put to one side for the following day's meal now an almighty row broke out and John doing what John does best he stormed up from the kitchen table he rose his fist yet again to Maud threatening her Maud had had enough she turned round to John and said I'm leaving you now John at the time he'd heard these threats many times before so it was like water off a duck's back but this time Maud meant it Maud stormed out of the house telling John she was going back to work but then when she returned home she wanted him gone Maud didn't go back to work instead she went to a neighbour's house now after spending a short time with the neighbours Maud waited until John left their house at number 12 and as he walked past the neighbour's house and Maud knew the course was clear she then left and went back to number 12 Whilst there, she collected some of her belongings, some clothing, some necessities of hers and her daughter Agnes's. And then she made her way up to 31 Clement Street and to where her sister lived. On Tuesday the 18th of September Maud along with Agnes left the sister's house at 31 Clement Street and Agnes was dropped off at St Mary's Primary School here in Woodnock. Now that primary school is no longer there and it's a small little housing estate. If we've got photos we'll put them over but we have loot and we can't find any of the, out, uh, the outside, the external sides of St Mary's School but I think we do have one where it shows a group of school children inside the main hall. But on the 18th of September and after Agnes was dropped off at St Mary's in Woodnock, Maud went back to work, unawares as to the events that would shortly spiral out of control. Now it was just after 3pm when John Warley made the short walk from 12 Victoria Street to St Mary's School. Inside he would ask to take out Agnes from school. And it was a school mistress who was very reluctant to let Agnes leave without Maud being there. But John kind of put on this persona and put on this story about how he was going to take Agnes over to Rishton with Maud. They were going for a day out. And after a short time of toing and froing, the school mistress allowed Agnes to leave school with John. And together, hand in hand, they were holding hands as they walked along and towards back to Victoria Street. John Warley would take Agnes into number 12. Now there's a, there's a question you've got to ask yourself and that is, why was the schoolmistress reluctant to let Agnes leave with John Wally? At the end of the day, he was her stepfather. Now I can only assume it's because the school knew about the violent outbursts and about the violence that John had inflicted, not just recently, but over the entire course of the marriage with Maud. People knew that he was a violent man. He had these outbursts of violence, verbally and physically. 
and um, it makes me wonder if the school may have known about this history with Maud and this is why they were reluctant to let Agnes leave however reluctantly they did allow Agnes to leave with John Wally and obviously the school mistress and the rest of the people in charge of the school had to live with that decision for the rest of their lives now here in the Woodnook area of Accrington a lot has changed and this area that we're walking down now used to what be or was the former East Lanks Railway and it carries on from this direction all the way through past where the Holland's Pies location is in Rising Bridge and Baxendon all the way through to Helmshaw and then further afield into Stubbins and, and uh, Ramsbottom now there used to be a mill here and you will have to excuse me but I don't know what the mills were called here at the time because there used to be one here and there's still the old mills which are all alongside Victoria Street where we're going to go to next but one of these mills is where Maud worked at the time of this horrific story so she was very close to where she lived at 12 Victoria Street September 1922 and the family John, Maud and Agnes left Claret Street where they were staying with his parents. They moved here to number 12 Victoria Street. Now the houses have long since been demolished, they've gone. But it was here on Victoria Street where they moved to. Things only got worse for Maud. And as soon as they moved into number 12 Victoria Street, they were sharing that premises with a lodger by the name of Sarah Ann Harbury. Now, Sarah herself was a lot older. She was 66 years old. But she was very friendly with the family. She looked after Agnes many a times when Maud was at work and when John was also at work at the Globe Centre. Sarah always found John to be a pleasant character, strangely. But things only got worse for Maud. The beatings, the physical, the verbal abuse got worse. And things would escalate to a point when Maud herself had just had enough. And things would escalate to such a point on September the 17th and 18th, 1923, exactly a year after they moved here onto Victoria Street. And Maud would tell John that she wanted a separation. She wanted to leave him. When Agnes arrived at number 12 along with her stepfather John. She could hear noise coming from one of the upstairs rooms. And Agnes shouted, Mother, Mother, expecting Maud to come running down her mother. Instead, it was Sarah Harbury who was upstairs. Now she heard Agnes shouting, Mother, Mother. So she made her way down to the bottom of the steps. She barely got to the bottom when she was thumped extremely hard on the forehead, knocking her onto the bottom steps and then obviously falling onto the floor below. John Wally commenced beating and punching and kicking Sarah Harbury while she was on the floor. At some point during the attack on Sarah, he picked up an old coal shovel where he then commenced beating her some more around the head. Now this obviously knocked Sarah Harbury unconscious. And the last thing she could remember at the forthcoming inquest was that she took the beating from John Wally and she remembered being dragged into the kitchen where she then lost consciousness. Now the attack on Sarah was so severe she lost several teeth. She had a broken jaw. She would also suffer from fractures to the ribs, to the skull, and she had lots and lots of cuts to her body, abrasions, bruises. John Wally pretty much left Sarah Harbury for dead in the kitchen. He then made his way into the front room and he took Agnes by the hand and he took her to the centre of the room and in front of where the fireplace was. He sat her down on an old hearth rug and then he walked over to the corner of the room to a set of drawers. Now inside one of those drawers was 
a razor. By four o'clock in the afternoon, and after, we think it was after the horrific attack on Agnes, Sarah Horbury had woken from her ordeal. She summoned the strength and the willpower to somehow crawl, or she made her way to number 18 Victoria Street. Why she didn't go to 14 or 16 or to the neighbours across the road. We just don't know and we will never know. Perhaps she did go to these houses but nobody answered the door. But she made it to number 18 Victoria Street and it was there she was attended by the owners Alice and Percy Withnell. Now they attended to her injuries and in the meantime there was a man, another witness, walking past along Victoria Street and it was there that he noticed John Wall himself acting bizarrely, frantically, in the front room of number 12. Now, he went up and he knocked on the door of number 12, but there was no answer. So he went round the back and he went into, and he found poor Sarah Horbury in the kitchen in such a mess. And it was there that he realised that something more sinister had gone on at number 12. He fled over the road to one of the mills which we're going to go past shortly and it was there that the police were contacted and, and they themselves quickly made their way to Victoria Street. Now where we are now is where the former home of Sarah Horbury, Maud, John and Agnes would have lived and it is somewhere on this stretch of grass here. Now back in 1923 there were a row of terraced houses all the way along here which as you can see have sadly gone now. So if we if we look at the house numbers on our left you've got two sorry you've got one three and five Victoria Street the odd numbers. So we believe that the even numbers starting at two four six eight on onwards would have been along this stretch. So you, you would have had maybe two four, six, eight, ten and twelve. So we're thinking number twelve would have been further towards maybe where these trees are, maybe set back a bit. But this is certainly, we feel, where the horrific events of September 1923 more certainly occurred. And it was just here. Now as you can see there is an incline and we know from the witness by the name of, I think it was Walter, he made his way up some steps towards number 12 and this is where he saw John Wally pacing up and down frantically in the front window. But when he made his way up the steps and he tried the door and he, he tapped on the door, there was no answer. He then went, I think, along the back streets towards number 18. So I say number, I don't know, number 12 maybe here, number 18 further back. He went up the back street and along to the back door where he saw Sarah Harbury in such a mess, such a disarray. Now, he left number 18 and he ran into one of the mills. So it could have been that mill in front or it could have been this mill to our left, one of these mills. But he certainly went into the mill, he ran into the mill and he asked for assistance where they, they phoned the police. Now, the first two police officers on the scene were PC Maudsley and PC Flegg and they made their way here to number 18 first and this is where they saw Sarah and Harbury. Obviously seeing Sarah in such a mess they made their way to number 12. They went in the back door and this is where they found John Wally lying on his back two feet off the floor with his head in a gas stove.
Now when PC Marsley made his way into the front room and he was confronted with such an horrific sight in front of him, from all accounts or from what we've read on one of the forums about true crimes, and it's a descendant of PC Marsley who has written an account of what her relation came across. One of the first things he did was rush into the back streets where he ended up being sick. And now this was because of the shock and because obviously the sights that he was seeing, and it's understandable. But when he made his way back into the front room and he had his composure and his wits about him, this little girl, Agnes, she was trying her best to get off the floor. John Worley had succeeded in taking the little hands off poor Agnes's arms, both hands. He had left her sat on that hearth rug, practically bleeding to death. And when PC Marsley first went into the room to help her and he picked her up, she was trying her best to lift herself up on the stumps of her arms. Now, the doctors at the time, Dr Wheeler and Dr Brook, will both later confirm that unwittingly or unknowingly, the actions little Agnes did to try to praise herself or prize herself up off the floor actually saved her life because the pressure she was putting on the stumps of her arms slowed the blood flow. If she had just sat there or collapsed backwards and fell asleep or unconscious on the ground, there is a high probability she would have died from the loss of blood. But her actions of trying to force herself up on the stumps of her arms to get back onto her feet actually saved her life. Now after the witness had rushed over to the mill that was close by, obviously Maud herself had got wind of what was going on or she got wind of something going on in her home. Now she fled the mill she was working at and made her way to number 12 and her home. Now there isn't much written about that, that point. There's no articles about Maud and about what she, what she saw and what she encountered. So we don't know what her emotions were and what she was going through. We, again, we can only assume, we can only presume what went on. We can only put ourselves in her position. But there is nothing that we can come across which will explain the scenes of chaos and finding her daughter in such a state. But certainly we know that she fled the mill in or around the time of the police themselves actually being called out to the scene. Now, why would John Warley cut the hands off poor, young, innocent Agnes? From all accounts, and this came out at the, the inquiry into the events, what happened on the 18th of September. But from all accounts, it seems that Maud would often, during one of the many famous rows that they'd have, she would raise her fists to John Warley. She would stand up to him, she was a strong-willed woman. But every time these rows kicked off and he was beating her and he was dragging her across the living room floors and the kitchen, all this physical abuse, Maud would lift her wrists, her hands to John saying, you can do anything you want but you can't take my livelihood away. In other words, he can't take her hands away. Her hands were her livelihood in the cotton mill. She would always say, you cannot take my livelihood, livelihood away. Do whatever you want to me, but you will never take these. He will threaten her sometimes by saying, I'll cut your damn arms off. But she took these as just as idle threats. So John Wally had this sick method in his madness by taking the hands of young Agnes. If he couldn't do it to his wife, Maud, he would do it to the most important, cherished possession in her world. And that would be her daughter, Agnes Rhodes. And we have to remember that Agnes was barely five years old when this horrific incident took place here in Accrington. Now, Sarah Harbury, she would spend just over six weeks recuperating in hospital before she would be allowed back home. Now, her injuries were so severe that I don't think she ever fully recovered from them. 
She had broken ribs, she'd lost tooth, she had a broken jaw. Her injuries were quite horrific. Agnes Rhodes Wildman, she came out of hospital only a few days after the attack on her and obviously she would find it difficult, especially being such a young age. She was just shy of five years old. But she, she would, just like her mother, become an extremely strong, willed, young, independent young lady. John Wally, on the other hand, he was asked to leave Hostel and he was escorted from Hostel and taken straight into police custody. And I think that was within a day or two of going to Hostel for his own wounds. Now he would go into police custody and he would be interviewed at least seven times, making court appearances at least seven times in Accrington. There was a lot of things going on in and around at that period and around Maud and Agnes as one could imagine but the excitement that this story brought to the townsfolk of Accrington it brought everybody out and the town hall where these court proceedings were taking place were always jam-packed full. It was on the 8th of November 1923 and just shortly before a month after the events had what occurred. John Wally would appear for the seventh time at the Accrington Police Courts and he would be charged on two accounts. Now one of those accounts would be the savage attack on Sarah Harbury with intent to murder. And the other, the other charge, the other account would be on the infliction and the wounds and the harming with intent to maim poor Agnes Rhodes. Witnesses will come forward, such as the neighbours who took in Sarah Harbury. Maud herself will be a witness and she would detail, as we have done, the events leading up to the attack on Harbury and her daughter Agnes. You know, the beating she's took, the verbal abuse she took throughout her marriage. Other witnesses will come forward, such as the, the wagon driver who saw Wally pacing up and down frantically in the living room. But one important witness was that of Dr Wheeler, the police surgeon who attended to all of the victims in this story, including John Wally. And he would tell the police that he asked John Wally why exactly he inflicted such pain and punishment on a young defenceless young girl and Wally's one simple reply to that was jealousy that is all he said to, to Dr Wheeler it was jealousy that pushed him to commit this act on Agnes Rhodes Now Agnes herself, she would attend this hearing and it would be her mother Maud that would lead her into the actual waiting court. And I must also mention that the courthouse itself was ramped. It was a wet, miserable morning. Queues had formed around the town hall where this, where this inquiry was taking place at least an hour before the doors opened. Curiosity, a morbid curiosity, one could say, had certainly struck at the heart of the community, the people of Accrington, and everybody wanted to know every little detail about this horrific crime. Now, little Agnes herself was led into the court, as we're saying, by her mother Maud, and Maud picked her up and sat her on her knees. Now, she was cross-examined, but only for a short period. I mean, you've got to remember, she was... She was barely five years old. She'd suffered such horrific injuries, life-changing injuries. 
So, you, so you, we can understand why she wasn't questioned for, for, for too long. But she was literally asked by the prosecuting teams what went on, what happened that day. And she would tell the listening jury that obviously she came home with John Warley, her stepfather, and she thought her mother upstairs and that's why she shouted mother, mother. Um, she would also detail a little bit about the attack on Sarah Harbury and then how she was led into the living room by her stepfather, John. She would also then detail that he took this razor from a set of drawers before commencing to cut her little hands off. Agnes herself was in tears throughout this ordeal in court and more so when she saw her accused sat in the dock. She couldn't stop crying, she got so upset when she saw John Wally sat there watching over her. And I can understand why. It must have been a, an horrific and a horrible experience. But for a five-year-old to go through that, I mean, the mind boggles and it really is an upsetting case. It really is. Now, we were talking about the events that PC Maudsley encountered and how he pulled out John Wally from the gas stove and how he, he dragged uh, John from the gas stove and a two-foot drop. Now, Mr Backhouse, who was defending John Wally, he would try his best to find more incriminating evidence on the police officers at the time rather than on their own clients. Obviously, they were defending John Wally. So they kept questioning him. Why didn't you just lift him up and place him on the floor? Why did you drag him? Now, PC Morsley simply said, well, what would you have done? To which Mr Backhouse himself, do not question me, please, in a curt reply. And it does seem really bizarre how, and I get that they're defending Wally, and I get they've got a job to do, but from an outsider looking in and somebody who doesn't know the law, and obviously I, I hold my hands up, I do not know the law, but it seems, it seems from an outsider's point of view why so much emphasis will be placed on the treatment of John Wally and not on how John Wally treated poor little Agnes and Sarah Harbury, as well as Maud leading up to the events of September 1923. So it was in December of 1923 that this horrific story would come full circle. And John Wally would take his stand at the Manchester Assizes in December, like I said, of that year. Everything, all the witnesses, the facts, everything would come out. And John Wally himself would admit to inflicting, obviously, these, these crimes and these injuries on two poor victims. Now, his defence team would try to go down the mentally insane route, but it wouldn't wash. Dr Wheeler and Dr Brooke would come out and say that all the time he was in hospital, having his own wounds attended to, not once did he show an ounce of being criminally insane. He was fully aware of everything that he had done and everything that was going on around him. There was no signs of being insane. Now, because John Wally didn't kill anybody, even though the intent was there, especially with Sarah Harbury, the courts could not find him guilty of such an offence, so they couldn't impose the death sentence. Instead, John Wally, he would be given servile penitude for life. Basically, he would spend the rest of his living days in prison with hard labour. Now I know with a lot of these stories, we do get asked a lot, what happened to the criminals once they were incarcerated in prison? The simple answer to this story is, we just do not know. We do have, I think it's like a register, like a sheet, and it does show John Wally and his charges, and obviously the verdict of being sentenced to several penitentiary, and I'll put that over. We have looked extremely hard into his life to try to find out if indeed he did serve the entirety of his life in prison, but we can't find anything. The case, the path, the story goes cold at this point. We don't know, like I said, if he died in prison. We just don't know anything else. 
if we do find more we can always do an update video or we can put it in the comment section here underneath this story today now as for the other people in this story again just like john wally the story of maud also goes cold we do know that she lived with agnes in dill I think it's called Dill Hall Lane, and again, I'll put the address down below. The 1939 census records shows a living with Agnes. But Agnes was also living with another person, her husband. You see, Agnes, in 1939, was married to an Arthur Weaver. And together, they would spend the rest of their lives in and around Blackburn and the Atkinson areas. Agnes herself will grow up to become a respected and a respectable young lady. She was an avid painter from all accounts and a lot of her work would go on sale here in Accrington. Many people would pay good money for her paintings. She was a well-liked, well-spoken of person. And obviously a lot of people at the time knew of her horrific story her backstory but there's also forum postings which we've read from people who encountered this person this old lady walking around Accrington and she didn't have any hands nobody knew why but people and I know it's going to sound a little bit morbid but a lot of people fondly remembered her as the lady with no hands it wasn't done in a malicious way, in a sick way, in a mocking way. It was just the lady with no hands. Nobody knew her backstory. But for sure, she'd become an avid painter, like I said, and everybody who knew her bought some of her work. I think, and I am saying the words, I think, but I am sure, and I think, there is or there was one of her paintings in the town hall at some point. It may well still be there, but the town hall is closed at the moment for refurbishment, so we can't go and check. But I am sure I read an article that one of her paintings, for quite some while, used to be hung up in the town hall itself. Now, if anybody knows if that's true or not, comment down below and let us know. I could be wrong, but I'm sure I read that somewhere. So, Vicky, she's quite rightly said we should sum up this video in the right way. And that is putting ourselves in the positions of two of well three of the people perhaps four of the people you've got the school mistress who allowed agnes to leave school when she did and she was very reluctant to do so you've got sarah harbury who suffered such horrific injuries to herself and then you've got obviously maud because it was a daughter and the abuse also maud received at the hands of wally and then you've got Agnes herself. So there's quite a few players in this story whose shoes it is very difficult to put ourselves into. The school mistress who allowed Agnes to leave, we mentioned this earlier in the video, how she must have felt all those years after knowing that young Agnes lost her wrists that afternoon. If she'd only stayed in school and kept her in school until the mother picked her up, this story wouldn't even be being told today. You've got Sarah Harbury who had to live with those, those nightmares, those thoughts, you know, being knocked unconscious and being unable to help poor Agnes. You've got Maud who suffered domestic abuse for all those years prior to being married and after being married and who was at work the day her young daughter was savagely attacked by Wally. And then obviously you've got little Agnes herself. And like Vicky said, Agnes would have had to adapt very quickly at such a young age. She would have to get by without the use of her hands. Everything that we take for granted today, you know, from washing, to brushing our teeth, to eating, to writing, to drawing, to getting changed, self-care, everything we take for granted by our hands, she had to do without, and she had to find a way to cope. But she did cope. She found a way, and through all the, all the adversity and through everything that was thrown at her at such a young age, she grew up to become such a well-respected, a well-liked lady. A an lady, a what, sorry? An independent, an independent lady, a strong-willed young lady. 
that's testament to to Agnes and even though this story is dark and people say why are we covering it why are we doing these stories this is why this is why we cover these kind of stories because at the end of it all sometimes just sometimes there is a happy ending and in this case Agnes fortunately had that happy ending she found love she got married I don't believe she had children again we've looked online at ancestry we've looked for census records to see if we can find any children we don't think Agnes and Arthur had children again if we are wrong comment down below and let us know but we are certain they never had children if they did we would love to speak to to the family members and we could do a follow-up story maybe an interview with somebody from the family but we don't believe they had children now as for Maud and Vicky has quite rightly said off camera as a mother and Vicky obviously being a mother she would have had to live with her own demons and her own thoughts for all those years after the attack on Agnes she may have been kicking herself and asking herself why didn't I leave Wally sooner why did I take her to school that day after I've just left him why didn't I stay at home with her that day she would have had to live with all these questions for years and years and years but like I said we can't find any more information on poor Maud and after 1939 we know she lived in Dill Hall Lane or Dill Hill Lane with Agnes and Arthur but then after that the story goes cold I just hope she did find some comfort at some point and she could forgive herself and I hope Agnes I, I don't think from what I'm reading I don't think Agnes was the type to hold bad grudges ill will she may have done towards John Wally obviously but I don't think she will have done it to her mother at the end of the day nobody could have foreseen what was going to come that, that afternoon on September the 18th so I don't think Agnes herself would have held yeah she wouldn't have held a grudge like Vicky said because she went to live with her, her mother like I said um, but yeah it's a shame that the, the case with certain characters in this story like I said it came to a dead end we have tried our very best like I said we've delved into the census records war records uh, pension records and things just seem to just just go flat at, at some level and it's, it's very frustrating because with these kind of stories and one we've covered previously I would love to have delved a little bit more and a little bit deeper into the ramifications after 1923 like John Wally did he serve full time in prison did he die in prison again if anybody knows let us know down below because it would be interesting to know if he was released at any point and did he come back to Atkinson and to the scene of that tragic event again let us know down below if you know any more on John Wally now what I will add shortly after the attack on Agnes a fund by the mayor of Accrington was set up originally to try to fetch in round about two or two and a half thousand pound in the end that fund swelled to over six thousand pound now this fund originally was intended to go to help the future of Agnes Rhodes for her obviously her upbringing and for all the help she was going to need in life because she didn't have her hands some of the money however would go to Sarah Harbury for the injuries she herself sustained because her life changed she struggled to walk she struggled to breathe because her ribs were broken um, she was an elderly lady after all she was 66 years old so some of the money did actually go to Sarah as well some of the fun money and it did help her but the majority of it would go to Agnes Rhodes and her mother as well that shows you just how impactful this this crime was on the people of Accrington back in 1923 just over £6,000 that was money back then and I'll put the equivalent to today's money down below now Vicky to my right has just mentioned and and I know it's going to be asked in the in the comment section at some point but how could this lady who had both her hands taken from her at such a young age how could she possibly become a painter there is ways or there are ways 
Now, okay, we're talking early 30s, 40s, 50s onwards, when prosthetics wasn't what they are today. I understand that. But it goes to show the strong-mindedness of Agnes Rhodes, the willpower, the stamina, the strength, the courage that this young lady had to become a painter. And, a, and, a, and an esteemed painter at that. Her paintings were apparently really, really good. Um, so obviously she, she, she took something which was taken from her, her hands. She took that belief, even though she couldn't do too much without her hands, but she took the belief that she could still have a successful career and a very, very happy life. She got married to Arthur. Now Arthur died sadly before Agnes and Agnes spent the last of her life, the remaining years of her life, at the Windside Care Home just outside of Accrington and not far from Accrington Football Club, Accrington Stanley Football Club. But she spent the rest of her life in that care home, being well looked after as well, I may add. Now it was here, like I said at the start, in Accrington Cemetery, where this story, it does come to an end. And just behind us is the crematorium. Now, we, again, we've looked on records, we've tried to find more information on Agnes, but again, just like Maud and just like John Wally, the story kind of goes cold at this point. But it is a tragic story, and it is one that myself and Vicky covered two, three years ago. We did a podcast story of, of this same story but we never came out to video it. Now, several people have videoed it since then, but we always kind of held back on it because of that. But the time is right. The years have gone by, we feel more confident, we've come out and we've taken you guys with us. Now, if you've enjoyed this story, as dark and as sad it is, please comment down below. Tell us, have you heard the story of Agnes Rhodes Wildman? If you have, let us know. Have you got relatives that maybe have known of this story or who perhaps still know any relatives of Agnes Rhodes? I'd love to know. We were contacted by somebody a few weeks ago who said that they had some painting or some picture, a sketch by Agnes and she'd also wrote on the back and they asked us if we wanted it and if we could pass it on to a family member. I replied back simply saying, unfortunately, we don't know any family members. We haven't got any contacts with family members, um, but we will be interested to see the picture. You know, we could go and visit these people who have it, or they could have sent us a photograph of it. Unfortunately, they never replied. I would love to see that picture, and I would love to see the notes that are written on the back of it. We'll maybe try again and try to contact them people, but we have tried, and unfortunately, they've not replied. Now that is all from here in Accrington and Accrington Cemetery where this video starts and ends. If you enjoyed this story, and I know it's a morbid one, I know it's a dark one, it's a sad one, but if you enjoyed it nevertheless, give us a big thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, but also don't forget to comment down below. If you have anything wrong in this story, if we've given a wrong date or a time, please jolt our memories and put it in the comments down below. We do try our best. Now in the meantime, we're going to disappear, we're going to get this video edited for you guys and we are thinking of tomorrow going out to cover another local story. It seems that these local stories are becoming more and more popular with you guys and we can only thank you. It's incredible just what people are doing for our little channel and we just love the discussions and the debates and the comments that you guys leave for us. So we are thinking of going out doing another local one. However, for those who may live further away from the northwest of England, we are traveling further afield. We've got other locations to come. So please don't be discouraged if you feel that all these stories are all localized. We are going to be going further away. But in the meantime, guys, that's it for this story. Do all those things I've just mentioned. But in the meantime, we always want you to stay safe, always stay curious, and we will be back soon with other tales from a dark, but at times glorious past. So take care, everybody.